Welcome to the podcast that takes apart Paul Krugman's New York Times column. Join us as Tom Woods and Bob Murphy teach economics by uncovering and dissecting the arrows of Krugman, Nobel Prize winner, newspaper columnist, and destroyer of nations. It's time for Contra Krugman. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tom Woods. This is Bob Murphy, and this is episode 87 of Contra Krugman, live here in Seattle. As Betsy mentioned, Bob and I do this every week. We release an episode of Contra Krugman every week. We review one of the two New York Times columns that Krugman has released that week, and we critique it. We search and search for something to find wrong in that column, and then we teach economics by doing so. There are a few uh, inside jokes in the podcast that will be understood by people who've been listening to a number of them. So if, if some people laugh at something and you're not following it, I don't know. What, what, what's our advice in that situation? Just laugh and pretend that you get the joke, Laugh too. and pretend that you get the joke. Listen to the podcast more often, which you can do at ContraKrugman.com. This episode being number 87, the show notes page is ContraKrugman.com slash 87. It's not up yet. Will be by the time this is being heard by our normal audience. But you folks are hearing it as we're recording it. So what we're doing this time is we're actually zipping through three of his columns just to give you a sense of what we do. So, because some of his columns will cover just one topic, we want to cover a multitude of topics. So we're going to zip through three of them, and they'll all be linked at that particular page. The first one is from May 8th, and it's called Republicans Party Like It's 1984. It's my job here on the show. Bob graciously allows me to talk once in a while on the show, and what I get to do is summarize the columns so I'm going to give you really brief summaries. Like these are executive summaries, like you're on your way to being executed and you have three seconds. That's how much of a summary I'm going to give you because we have three of them to do. So this one is from May 8th, just uh, not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago. And what, what the, uh, the gist of this is that um, the Republicans, according to Krugman, more or less can't ever be trusted. All right, well, so far so good. But... What he's arguing is that we got a whole lot of bluster about Obamacare. We need to repeal it. We're going to have this tremendous replacement. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to do all these great things. And he says, you know, the reality of what the Republicans gave us for legislation on health care fell rather short of expectations. He says, look, this thing breaks every promise the Republicans ever made about health. Deductibles are going to rise, not fall. Premiums may fall for a handful of young, healthy, affluent people, but they're going to rise for everybody else. Uh, there are going to be cutbacks for all sorts of vulnerable people. And this is, um, this is exactly what they want to do. This is how Republicans are. They want to take health insurance away from people. That, I mean, and he, he puts it quite that way, by the way, in a couple of these columns we're going to be talking about. This is what they naturally thrive on, which is taking away things from vulnerable people. And he says that according to independent estimates of an earlier version of Trump care, people with incomes over a million dollars will save an average of more than $50,000 a year. And there's a good chunk of GOPers for whom that's all, that's all they care about is these, these folks at the top. So this is the style of the, of the, of the uh, typical Krugman column. It it's, uh, goes after the GOP, says that they're only in it for the wealthy and they just want to hurt vulnerable people. So he says, I personally think that Donald Trump gets some positive pleasure out of people who take, who, who made the mistake of trusting him for a ride. And uh, he says, look, this is a freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength moment. Uh, th what we were presented for health care is, is positively Orwellian. So first, so the first column is to argue that, uh, the Republicans may have talked an awful lot about all the flaws of Obamacare, but then they turn around and give us something that is horrific and awful and in no way an improvement. Then secondly, May 12, 2017, Judas, I, I like how there's, we're not getting too over the top here, Judas is trotted out. Judas, tax cuts, and the great betrayal. And he means Judas is a bad thing, just to clarify. Right, he's using Judas as a bad, right. And he's saying, and basically Judas here, did we decide Judas was Mitch McConnell, more or less? Yeah, okay. And the argument in this column is that surely there are Republicans who know that 
Trump is probably in some way compromised by the Russians, but they are willing to overlook this because Trump is going to deliver them their greatest wish, which of course, what is a Republican's greatest wish? Taking health care away from vulnerable people. So as long as Trump is going to take health care away from vulnerable people, they'll look the other way about the Russia stuff. And so that's why McConnell is Judas. He's, pre pre he's prepared to betray everybody. Uh, he's prepared to look the other way and betray everybody if he can just get what his heart truly desires, which is taking people's health care away. Now, I, you think, Woods, you must be summarizing this in a tendentious way. Nobody argues that way. Either you don't listen to Contra Krugman or you don't read his columns. Now, if you don't read his columns, you have a happier life. If you don't listen to Contra Krugman, it's sadder. I'm telling you, it's sadder. We have a fun podcast. What, what, what can I tell you? So Krugman generously says, look, we don't know for sure that top Trump officials and maybe even Trump himself are Russian puppets. We don't know that for sure. However, uh, you know, wink, wink, he says. He says, but you know what? This is typical of conservatives, because after all, look at the America Firsters from the 1930s. They loved foreign dictators, just like Trump loves a foreign dictator. So this is typical of Republicans. There's nothing unusual about this. They're just reverting to form. Whew. Okay, that's two columns. The third one we're going to share with you today is the May 15th column, The Priming of Mr. Donald Trump. And here we have Krugman saying, isn't it ridiculous Donald Trump thinks he invented the term priming the pump to refer to the economy? Well, what Trump actually did was he gave a, a, an interview to The Economist magazine. And he said, we're going to cut taxes because we want to prime the pump. And Bob's going to talk a bit about that uh, when we get to it. But Krugman, as most people, took that to mean, because Trump then said, uh, he asked the reporter, are you familiar with this? term, this use of this term, because uh, I, I wasn't, and you know, I, you know, I made it up the other day, and I rather like it, and people took this to mean, boy, this guy thinks he invented the, the term priming the pump, so we're going we're gonna to talk about that. But anyway, the typical way that phrase is used is we need more government spending pumped into the economy to get the thing going, and Krugman spends the column explaining what that's all about and why, that, why it can be useful to do that. But what he's arguing now, and what he indeed argued a few months ago, was that, yes, even though Krugman for years has been calling for deficit spending, for years, bigger deficits, we need bigger deficits, all of a sudden in 2017, you'll never guess, now's the time to keep an eye on the deficit. All of a sudden, we got to watch spending. That happened in 2017. We've got to watch spending. He says, because things are totally different now from when I was talking about why we need to increase spend. Th things are totally different, he says. And he goes through and gives you all these reasons that things are different now. They're so much different than they were like three months earlier when I was telling you we needed the opposite. So we're going to go through exactly what's allegedly different. We did do this, by the way. We devoted all of episode 69 of Contra Krugman to exactly that, to how different are things from the five minutes ago when he was saying we need to increase spending? And it turns out these indicators were exactly the same then as they are now. Uh, the one difference seems to be there's a guy with an R next to his name in the White House now. And suddenly, we've got to be careful about deficits. So, he is willing to say, I would accept deficits if it's in exchange for more infrastructure. That, that he's fine with. He says, but really, what does Trump want deficits for? just so he could give tax cuts to his rich friends. Now you think, Woods, okay, I listened to your summaries, and this is all just like boilerplate, this sounds like a speech from the Democratic Party convention from 1984. Like, How could you possibly get any economic knowledge out of this? You can't. What you can do, though, <laughs> is by teaching the opposite of everything he just said, you can, in fact, convey some economic knowledge, and Bob, I am now going to place the burden of that task upon your shoulders. I'm going to hand you these columns back that you lent me. I don't really want them anymore. And now, Bob, I am going to let you start us off. Let's st why don't we start off with the claim that premiums, health premiums, would fall for maybe a handful of people if Obamacare were replaced. A handful of people. 
All right, so let me just uh, read these. So Krugman's got this rhetorical style in, when he's talking about healthcare to try to minimize and just show the, the disparate impact. So he, he can't just say there's literally no single person in the United States who would benefit from this Republican plan. And I should say as a caveat, because I know we have some people here who have never heard the podcast, it, because Krugman holds up you know, here, we don't even have to engage in hyperbole. He's literally calling the Republicans Judas. Okay, so this is the way he talks. So when we're criticizing him, it comes off sometimes like we're defending the Republicans, and it's not that so much. It's just more that we're saying, no, these claims are hyperbolic, and let's look at this more accurately. So by no means should any of this come off like we're all in favor of you know, the, the health reform that was coming out of D.C. lately, but we're just trying to show how, how misleading a lot of Krugman's claims are. So, for example, he says, premiums may fall for a handful of young, healthy, affluent people, but will rise in many cases. Da, da, da. Right, so he's using the term handful there when, in fact, you know, this is obviously millions of people, that the original Affordable Care Act, the very nature of it was to sort of put everyone into comparable pools to make it illegal for health insurance companies to discriminate according to you know, pre-existing conditions. It did things like say the spread between premiums on people based on age can only be a factor of three, right? So take two otherwise equivalent people, but one person's 70, the other person's 22, then the health insurers under the Affordable Care Act could charge no more than three times the premium, which is artificial. You know, that was a much narrower ban than had been the case before. So obviously if you undo that, well, then now it's not that the young and healthy are implicitly subsidizing the older and the people with pre-existing conditions. So, again, just the rhetorical trick there of Krugman saying premiums may fall for a handful of people. Let me uh, give you another example of, of what I mean here. So he, later in the same column, he says, uh, according to independent estimates of an earlier version of Trump care, people with incomes over $1 million would save an average of more than $50,000 a year. Okay, so he's... Krugman's trying to show the despair, like to say, who are the winners and the losers? And that's all he says about the fact that there, there are large tax cuts involved with the Republican plan, because again, remember the Affordable Care Act came with huge tax increases. That was partly how they were going to contain the impact on the deficit from all this, you know, new subsidies. So of course, if you undo that, well then that's going to be a huge tax cut. So let me just give you an example of how slippery Krugman can be. So if you and I should say, with what I've learned doing this podcast, I thought at the beginning that, you know, to, to show the contrast of what Krugman's numbers are with more realistic ones, you would have to go to, like, the Cato Institute or Heritage. No, all you need to do, typically, is click the link and then see how it's the exact opposite of what, the way Krugman summarized it. So for this one, just for example, I'll just give you this, these numbers, Tom, and turn it back over to you. It's what Krugman said is true, okay? You can go to the link and you can find the table... Uh, that he was talking about here. But let me give you some more facts. So he, coming away from that, you would think that, oh yeah, this is just for rich people. This table, so it's from, who is this from? It's from the Urban Institute. They did a tax assessment, not of the most recent one that passed the house, but the original one that didn't get through. But you know, the grand scheme, they're, they're comparable. And so yes, it is true. They put a little thing in there saying for households that earn more than a million dollars a year, on average, they will save $50,000 on their tax bill, and that is a shocking statistic. But if you think about why, what's driving that? Well, it's because the Affordable Care Act included things like a 3.8% surtax on net investment income. Okay, so clearly that kind of a tax is explicitly designed to just hit upper income people. And so if you unroll that, well then obviously it's gonna help upper income people, okay? But far be it, it's not true to say this is just for the upper crust. For example, if you add up all the people whose taxes go down, it's 54.9% of all households. Right? That's more than half. Right? I know there's Austrians in the crowd who don't like mathematical economics, but I'm just letting... 54.9% is more than half the country. And yet, from reading you know, Krugman's summary, you would have thought it's just the upper crust. And then the other thing, I'll, just, I'll end on this, Tom. The, the group, you know, they have it broken out in income categories. The household group based on income who gets the highest percentage tax cut under the Republican plan that was in this thing are people who make less than $10,000 a year, that they get a 4.8% income tax cut because of some you know, premium tax credit that's part of the Republican plan. Okay, so it's more than half the country gets their taxes cut and the biggest chunk in terms of percentage of income going down because of the Republican, it goes to the poorest people, and yet the way Krugman summarized all the information in that chart was to say, oh yeah, people making more than a million dollars a year save more than 50,000 
this is crazy, that's why Judas, or no, this, this one they compared to Orwell. It was 1984. Judas is next. I got mixed up, sorry. Okay. Yeah, you can't keep track of all, your, all the wildly exaggerated language that he uses. I want to read to you from my phone here uh, the text, just a paragraph or two from a, an interview I did with a physician uh, maybe a year and a half ago. It's a Dr. Josh Umber who he and his father ran together for governor and lieutenant governor of Kansas on the Libertarian Party ticket. And, um, you know, when we talk about health care, half the time we're arguing these wonkish policy plans, and a lot of us would like to just see a, a genuine free market in health care, just physicians and patients, and that's it. But it's hard to imagine what that would look like because we have such a distorted market, we have so much government involvement, we have an artificial encouragement of, the, of health insurance in general because of uh, tax privileges and so on. And so it's hard for us to imagine what life would look like in the absence of this. Well, Dr. Umber is a great example of, of what it would look like because he's more or less trying to operate as if there were no government or insurance. He runs his practice. It's called it's atlas.md. He runs his practice like a membership service where you pay a monthly fee and you get everything he offers as part of that monthly fee, whatever you need. And so I want to read, this is, this is real. This is happening right now. Uh, this, is, this is Dr. Umber talking to me. He says, it's a flat rate per month based on age, just like a gym membership. For that membership, you get unlimited home visits, work visits, office visits, technology visits like email, cell phone, texting, Twitter, Facebook, Skype, basically whatever we want, because now we're not limited to what insurance will allow or pay for. Uh, this is generally, by the way, $50 a month. $50 a month. He says, then we have no co-pays in our office. Any procedure we can do in the office is included free of charge, because that's what the membership is covering, just like any equipment in the gym is included at the base membership price. So stitches, biopsies, joint injections, ultrasounds, bone scans, lung scans, urine testing, strep throat testing, minor surgical procedures, all included for free. Then one more paragraph. He says, then something else we can do that makes us very unique and valuable is wholesale medications, labs, imaging, and pathology. We had a perfect example recently. We ordered some blood work. We have our negotiated cash discounts of usually 95%, and a patient's blood work was accidentally billed through the insurance rate because of a computer mistake at the lab. The price they were quoted was $1,028. We ran that back through our system, and it cost $39. And it's an amazing opportunity. So anyway, so then he says, uh, we can do the same things with medications. We, we outcompete the Walmarts, the CVSs, the targets of the world, because we have a different business model. We can dispense medications in Kansas just like a pharmacist. Forty-four states allow physicians to function like this. So I can order the medications wholesale from the same place as the pharmacies do, but I can get a thousand blood pressure pills for $8.33. Even after my 10% markup, they're under a penny a pill. Walmart would literally have to give them away to outcompete us, and if they do, great, we still win. It's not a value that's a, that's a revenue generator for us. We're simply adding to the value of our membership. It's very Costco-esque. You're going to want to read this entire interview because it's stunning. All right? that, that sounds like it's from Mars. Right? That doesn't sound like anything that we're accustomed to, and yet it's going on right now. So I am going to invite you to do something. Bob's going to roll his eyes, but let him roll them. It's my turn. Okay? I thought you were going to say it was your show. And I was going to say, <laughs> oh, contraire. <laughs> It's a 50% share. <laughs> yeah, that almost slipped out just now, didn't it? Um, if you've got a smartphone, I'm going to send you, I just wrote an e-book on health care. It's called Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Health Care. I was so happy with that title. All you've got to do is, to, you're going to text a word to a number. The number is 33444, and I'll send you this awesome thing, including that interview. To the number 33444, just text as all one word, healthcare. Text healthcare as all one word to 33444, you'll get that ebook. Now, if you're saying to me, if you're out there, you're saying, Woods, I don't have a smartphone and I'm feeling very, very left out and depressed at this moment. What can you do for me? I bought the domain name yourfriendsarewrong.com. <laughs> you can also get the book there. <laughs> How was that available? Where's the creativity in America anymore? 
How was I able to buy that for 10 smackers? All right. Anyway, so get that. You'll really enjoy it. Bob, let's talk about... Yeah, I was uh, going to say, are you done selling stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I'm selling something that's free, I, I might add, by that's the way. That's even worse. All right. <laughs> that's a good one. All right. Don't cost you nothing. All right. Let's talk about Judas and Russia right now. In that column... All right, so Bob, maybe you want to say a little something, but just, just a word, I mean, it doesn't matter. But the, the, whole, the whole Russia thing, I personally think is a bit overblown. It doesn't mean I'm the world's biggest fan of Donald Trump, obviously, but the creepy people who are behind the scenes here give me the willies even more than he does. But that's my, I, my personal opinion is that they are more sinister than he is. Well, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, I mean, uh, but I was just going to say, there's... I've talked to a lot of people about this, and Bob, I mean, we've, for the most part, we're just spectators of this. We're reading the news like anybody, and I'm still waiting to hear what the big, horrible thing is I'm supposed to be worried about. Right. So, again, this is another area where, you know, it's certainly it's not that, you know, oh, Tom and I checked it out, and actually Russia had nothing to do with the election. It's all good. You know, how could we know? We wouldn't know. You can't prove a negative. But the point is, for somebody like Krugman in particular, let me just walk through how dubious this story is or, or how tenuous his position. Because for those of you who've been listening to the show or reading Krugman's columns, you know that he was absolutely furious with Comey when he came out you know, shortly before the election, and understandably so. Hillary was Krugman's candidate. What Comey did was kind of shocking. And then especially since then, they retracted it a few days later and said, oh, oh actually, okay, no, there's nothing here. Go ahead, get everyone go and vote, it's fine. So I get why Krugman would have been furious and then, you know, when then Hillary loses, of course, and so that was Krugman's refrain, right? It's not that Hillary Clinton, it's, it couldn't possibly be that she lost the election fair and square. There had to be cheating. And so in many columns and blog posts, have that whenever Krugman would talk about the latest, you know, outrage from the Trump administration, he would say, thanks, Comey, right? And so that was like his sort of snarky way of saying, Look, good job, Comey, you threw the election. Okay, so again... In Krugman's mind, you know, is this guy Comey somebody who's trustworthy, an upstanding public servant? No, this is a guy who, through the election, clearly, you know, he must have known that there was nothing there, and yet, for some reason, he did something having to know how much that would throw the election. So, in Krugman's mind, this guy Comey clearly, you know, is, is a bad apple. All right, and I don't know, to be fair, I don't know that Krugman ever said that he should resign or he should be fired. Certainly, many Democrats did say that stuff before. Okay. Now, of course, all of a sudden, Krugman's repeating just matter-of-factly all the things we know about what happened. For example, we just know that Trump told Comey, you know, it'd be great if uh, you, know, you could just let this thing with Flynn go away. You know, I'm paraphrasing, but you, you guys have all heard that, the thing that's coming from this memo and so on. So let me just make sure you get the timeline of what happened here. So as of, like, let's say January... Krugman would have been saying, thanks, Comey, for you know, throwing the election, complete dereliction of duty. Flynn actually resigned on February 13th. This uh, meeting in which uh, Trump allegedly told Comey, hey, can you back off Flynn, happened the next day, February 14th. Okay, so make sure you realize the timeline here, even according, even if this, everything is true that Comey's talking about in these, this, this memo that he has supposedly wrote up, it's not that Flynn was still safely in his job and Trump was kind of contained thing. Flynn, everything had already blown up and Flynn had to resign, and that's the day afterwards. So again, it's not clear, you know, even if this did happen, it could be that Trump just meant the guy's career is ruined. He's going to go down in history as a Russian spy, basically. Can you at least just stop investigating the guy? It's, again, we don't know, but that's the context. It's not that he was trying to prevent people from learning the truth. The guy had already resigned the day before. Comey says nothing about this, you know, all through there while he still has his job. In early May, he t Comey's testifying to the Senate, and a senator says to him, I'm, I'm slightly paraphrasing, but this is cl close, said... You know, hypothetically speaking, uh, if the attorney general or senior officials at the Department of Justice were to lean on the FBI and say they wanted you to drop a pending investigation, could they do that? And Comey says, theoretically, yes. And the senator comes back and says, has that ever happened in your experience? And Comey says, no, not in my experience. That would clearly you know, cause a lot of eyebrows to be raised if, if, the, if they interfere with an investigation like that. Okay, so again... It's possible that Comey was, you know, thinking, no, strictly speaking, he asked me about the attorney general and, you know, Department of Justice officials, not the president himself. But that would have been a good time to say, by the way, Trump actually did, you know, obstruct justice a few months ago. But he, Comey didn't say anything in response to those questions. And the only time he, this comes out is after he gets fired. 
Okay, so again, that doesn't prove what did or did not happen, but I'm just saying it's weird that this guy who Krugman was vilifying is, you know, this corrupt guy who threw the election now, after he gets fired, this stuff comes out that arguably he misled senators under testimony or under oath to say there, there was no, nobody from the, you know, executive branch leaning on me or higher levels to, to drop this investigation. So I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Tom. All right. Yeah, something needs to be said about a highly, highly unfashionable group uh, that is targeted in this column. I beg your pardon? Oh, uh, let's, oh no, I don't. No, no, I don't even. I don't want to see them ever again. Actually, but thank you for, thanks for the option. It's it's the the America First Committee. Now nobody nobody likes them today because they were on the wrong side of history. Didn't they know that, you know, World War II needed to be uh, needed to be fought in the way that it was fought? Now a lot of the America Firsters were of the opinion that you let the two totalitarian countries fight each other and you just stay out of it. You don't favor one. But that, that was more or less their view. Now then, of course, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, America First closed its doors the very next day. Well, Krugman says in the column that many, he uses the word many, of their most prominent members openly supported foreign dictators, by which, of course, he would mean Hitler. So I did what Bob has taught me, because I'm really, you know, Bob's my mentor, and, and, and I... I mean, really, there's nobody on earth who knows Krugman better than Bob and who knows Krugman's tactics. So Bob always told me, whenever Krugman makes a claim and he uses a link to link you to the evidence for the claim, click the link. Because he's bluffing half the time. He doesn't think you're going to click the link. You click it, and as Bob will sh has shown, half the time, the link says the opposite of what Krugman says. So I did it this time. I clicked the link. Who are We're these? In episode 87, he's finally taken my <laughs> advice. <laughs> That's right. So I clicked through. Who are these many people from the America First Committee? Even, despite the fact the America First Committee openly and expressly said, you're not welcome in the America First movement if you have any foreign sympathies whatsoever, uh, including for fascism or socialism or communism or anything. You are not welcome. Anyway, so who were these many people? So I clicked on. And there was only one person who was even remotely accused of this in the, at the link, and that was Charles Lindbergh, who even he obviously was not sympathetic to foreign dictators, given that he fought in the war against those dictators. You, you don't normally go bomb people you sympathize with, and you also don't go over, as, as Lindbergh did, he went over to Germany, saw the German Air Force up close, got all the details he could about it, and then came home and shared it all with American intelligence. Oops. So there's actually an interesting book on, on the whole Lindbergh matter by James Duffy that I recommend. It's called Lindbergh versus Roosevelt, The Rivalry That Divided America. But the long and the short of it is that was the only name I could find in that link. Other people who I would consider to be rather prominent who were associated with America first would be names like Gerald Ford, uh, JFK even, for a time. There were literary figures. I mean, well, first of all, there were uh, Norman Thomas. There were several progressive senators. They had 850,000 members overall. There were literary figures like Sinclair, Sinclair Lewis and E.E. E. Cummings. I mean, all kinds of names you associate with traditional Americana, not one of whom had the slightest sympathy for any foreign dictator. All right, let's go to the priming of the pump thing. Because Bob read the interview with The Economist that Donald Trump did. And so, therefore, Bob's qualified to speak on it. So go ahead and do that. Right. So the, the, in case you didn't hear this, the people were making fun of Trump left and right, literally left and right, were making fun of him. Um, because there was this awkward sentence that came out of this interview. So, so Trump had two, I think it was two people from the, the Economist magazine had come in. Uh, and, did a, and did an interview with him, and then that went, and so it was, this was being shared around, and everyone was saying, oh my gosh, Trump is even more of an imbecile, and a, you know, a, a idiot than we thought, and he's even crazier, and so on. So again, I clicked and went to go read it, and I was, I have to tell you, in terms of, if you were worried about, you know, is, is Trump just kind of like putting on a show, and really, you know, some of his over-the-top, bombastic statements aren't as, uh, indicating of his mental state of health that you would have thought. This thing actually reassured me, okay, that Trump is very reasonable. He talks, for example, 
talking with you know NAFTA and Trump had threatened he was going to pull out, and then he gets phone calls from you know the prime minister, president of Mexico, and he says in the interview, and they asked me, can you postpone? Can we talk about this? And I said, okay, out of respect for them. Okay, so that's not like the crazy Trump image that you get that he says, out of respect for you know the leader of Mexico, I decided to reconsider. Right, so I'm just saying things like that. Another example, people were saying, oh, in this interview, Trump says that he introduced the world to Mike Pence, but that's not true, that's a dirty lie. People knew who Pence was. If you go and look it up, what Trump's doing is, so he's talking to the interviewers, and then he goes, hey, has anybody heard of Mike Pence, the vice president? And then Pence walks in. So Trump's putting on a show, it's like a wrestling match. You know, he's like, get your hands together for vice president Mike Pence. That's what he was doing. He wasn't saying, had anybody heard of this guy before and you know, picked him as my vice president. So I'm saying little things like that, it seems like people almost willfully trying not to understand him. Another quick example, in this interview, Trump's talking about NAFTA, and he says the U.S. has a trade deficit with Canada right now, and he throws out some number, and, and Matt Iglesias at Vox says, that's a dirty, rotten lie. We actually have a trade surplus with Canada. So I was curious, so I'm sort of a sleuth. What I did is I went to Google, and I typed in U.S.-Canada trade balance. <laughs> Literally, the first hit was to the Census Bureau. I clicked it, and the number matched what Trump said. So I was like, that's weird. So what happened was, Iglesias was looking at the goods and services, which was a surplus. Trump was just looking at the goods. Okay, so fair enough. But again, that's little things like that where clearly, you know, rather than trying to say, it's weird that Trump would lie and make up a specific number that's totally, you know, instead of just trying to figure out where he get that number from and realize, oh, he was talking about the goods deficit. Just, nope, he's a liar. Okay, so the last thing, this issue about the prime, the prompt. So... Trump says, we have to prime the pump. And the economist person says, it's very Keynesian. And then Trump says, uh, we're the highest tax nation in the world. Have you heard that expression before for this particular type of an event? And the economist guy says, priming the pump? And Trump says, yeah, have you heard of it? Yes. Have you heard that expression used before? Because I haven't heard it. I mean, I just, I came up with it a couple days ago and I thought it was good. It's what you have to do. Okay, so that's the, the snippet that they quoted. And so my point is, Trump talks funny. He says weird stuff, but if Trump were really saying, I invented, I coined this phrase two days ago, would he have had three follow, you know, introductory questions to say, have you ever heard that before, right? If I claimed that I made up a new song, I wouldn't say to Tom, hey, have you ever heard this song before? And then, you know, sing a few bars of it, and then say, because ah, I made it up yesterday. That wouldn't make any sense, right? You know what I'm saying? So I, I think possibly what happened is Trump was saying, like, I hadn't heard that phrase in this context before. I stumbled across it, and now that's what we're using, because I think it's a cool phrase. H have you ever heard it used like that before? So, yeah, certainly it shows he's not a policy wonk and didn't realize Keynesians have been using that since the 30s, but I don't think Trump was claiming I coined this phrase two days ago because otherwise his earlier questions make no sense. Let's just really quickly hit the... Um, we can't have deficit spending now because conditions are totally changed because he says, you know, he's talking about quit rates and stuff like that. C just give us 30 seconds of why when he first made that claim a few months ago, it turns out that months earlier when he was saying we do need deficit spending, all these factors that he said are now totally different were exactly the same then. When, when under Obama, he was saying we need deficit spending. Right. So we had an episode. Do you remember the episode number was? Number 69. Yes. Yeah, so in episode 69, we, we had it. Krugman had the, the, the best column of all time. It was literally titled Deficits Matter Again. Okay. Imagine that because now all of a sudden Trump's in. So everyone kind of knew Krugman was going to have to pivot that he was calling for big deficit spending all along, but now that Trump's in and wanting to have big infrastructure spending and tax cuts that would cause the deficit to blow up, Krugman wouldn't be for it, right? And so when Krugman tried to explain why it would have been good for Obama to have bigger deficits, but now it's awful that Trump, he gave two things and he said, oh, because the economy's recovered now, uh, quit rates are going up, meaning you know more the percentage of people who have jobs and then quit it for various reasons, that's going up. So that shows workers aren't worried about losing their job as much and they, they think they can get rehired. And also that wages are rising. And so we went through and just documented any column Krugman had written in 2016 before the election where Krugman had used the words deficit or uh, I think borrowing was another one and just see the context. And so he was all throughout four bigger deficits making fun of the deficit scolds and, and those people. And we checked the numbers, the quit rates and the rising wages, the, the same statistics he was using, they were like that, you know, all throughout 2016 as well. So again, these, he, he had to, 
Krugman knew he was going to be accused of inconsistency, and so he grabbed two figures to try to explain why things were different now, but those particular statistics had been the same all throughout. And the last smoking gun was after the election, November 14th, 2016, because of time I won't read the quote to you, but just go listen to that episode if you want, 69, you'll see Krugman literally said that conditions right now are like they were in 2008, not as much, but the economy still needs uh, deficit spending and Trump's plan is poorly designed. You don't get as much bang for the buck, but we could still use it. All right, so again, it's like Krugman versus Krugman at this point. You know where you will get a real bang for the buck? <laughs> Contra Cruz, correct. <laughs> we do have some listeners in the audience. Yeah, That's great. Yeah. All right, yeah. Okay, so we have to, every episode we have to do this. <laughs> we have to have some awkward segue into our cruise. Can you believe Bob and I, is that, isn't that the most unlikely two people in the world to be hosting a cruise? And yet people come to it. They're as crazy as we are. So every year, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we put ago. suntan lotion in our bald spots, so just don't worry. <laughs> and we have, uh, it, it's, uh, it's October 2017, this year, ContraCruise.com. It's a week of hilarity. Like, okay, so yeah, we teach some stuff, but then we do, like we did Family Feud with Libertarian Questions, which was fantastic. We did Pictionary with Libertarian Personalities and Ideas. Yeah. And, but I mean, just not, and then Bob sang, not just karaoke, but sang with his band. And this year we got special guests, Scott Horton, the great foreign policy expert we love, is coming. Michael Bolden of the 10th Amendment Center is going to be among our guests. Jordan Page, the musician who now lives in Washington State, like you folks, is going to be there. It's going to be tremendous. So if you have any, if you're saying, man, the two people in the world I would most like to vacation with are Tom Woods and Bob Murphy then ContraCruise.com is your website. All right, there's a lot more we could say about these columns, Bob, but I believe that the at this point, they're going to start pulling the fire alarm on us. So you want to just wrap her up now? <laughs> yeah, well, okay, okay. It's the awkward pause. Thanks for listening Thanks, to Contra Krugman. Subscribe to the show for free on iTunes or Stitcher at ContraKrugman.com. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, our blog, books by Tom and Bob, and more at ContraKrugman.com. See you next week.